Yeah, so we'll try to keep it fairly custom to uh, those who are looking to create one of these for themselves or for a loved one. Um, but we never skimp on the policy details since that's what really excites us over here. So we'll try to keep it a hybrid of both, but make sure it's digestible for the average everyday Torontonian. Love it. So I'm going to share these results. Uh, I mean, two thirds are homeowners in some way, shape or form. That's exciting. I mean, uh, we, I mean, generally speaking, our, our clients are uh, about two thirds landlords or uh, two homeowners looking to, to rent. Um, and then uh, the other third is, I mean, um, sort of a, a, a multi-generational living or sort of building guest houses or, uh, or sort of housing flexibility into their lots. So we'll cover all of the above. Um, so I guess, Craig, go ahead. Sure. So uh, one fun thing that's changed tonight is this used to all be customized to laneway suites, but tonight we're calling them ADUs or accessory dwelling units. Uh, as many of you probably know, the city just enacted a new policy that allows for garden suites, which is essentially a laneway suite, but in a backyard that doesn't have a laneway. So we're trying to encompass all detached secondary housing units that live in your backyard. Um, tonight, we're going to go over sort of the reason why those exist in Toronto now. We'll talk about the zoning bylaws for both typologies, laneway and garden suites. Uh, we'll explain certain use cases and why you may want to develop one, look at some of our projects and the construction details that go into them, as well as the design case studies. I don't know if you can hear those crying children in the background, but forgive and noise. If you hear a crying adult soon, it's, it's I'm right on the edge. So, uh, so for when we look at why ADUs exist in Toronto, it's really important to look at sort of the whole uh, landscape of our region and specifically how our population has been changing, um, as well as the history of how they've existed in our city because laneway houses especially have existed in Toronto for essentially a hundred years. Uh, many of our earliest laneway houses are actually buildings that were used for agrarian or industrial uses that used to be integral in our neighborhoods. Uh, in the post-World War II era, we really went crazy in using single-use zoning policies that kind of ousted these uses from our neighborhoods. And when that happened, people started taking these vestigial structures and converting them into housing. So a lot of the structures you've seen here, these are all laneway houses that we've worked on um, that were either done before or since the laneway policy was enacted. Um, since these ones kind of blazed a trail, there's been a more recent push for uh, what we call laneway houses. Uh, all the images you see here are projects that are essentially new homes that were built on laneways. Um, they really relied on those historic structures to set the precedent and create uh, the purpose behind these kinds of one-off projects. The problem with these ones was that they tended to be on detached lots that were in the middle of a block. They didn't have any street frontage. They may have been suitable for housing, but the process you had to go through to get them approved was extremely expensive and cumbersome. So they were not a one size fits all solution to actually solving housing issues in the city. But fast forward to 2018, where uh, our team worked with the city to come up with an as of right policy. So that is a zoning bylaw that essentially gives you the right to build a relatively small structure um, so long as you conform with what we all agree is a reasonable size and shape of a house, either on a laneway or in the backyard now. And that's, that's what we call laneway suites and what you'll soon see known as garden suites. Uh, garden suites have really been something that has again started elsewhere, um, especially on the West Coast, uh, cities like um, Portland, and Austin have kind of embraced these sorts of auxiliary dwelling typologies. Uh, it's something that's spread into Canada. Uh, there's currently a policy as close as Ottawa, as well as in some prairie provinces. So it's something that has been a long time coming here and we're pretty excited to see it. 
So when we look at our region and kind of the pressures that led to this policy being enacted, we tend to focus on what's known as the Greater Golden Horseshoe. So it's kind of the mega city surrounding Toronto. This whole area is penned in by uh, what is known as the Green Belt. So this is a combination of the Oak Ridge's moraine, uh, protected natural land and farmland that precludes any kind of dense development. And what that means is that anyone who moves to this region can't build houses out, they can't sprawl, we have to intensify within. And over the last several decades, we've seen the population of this area grow by about 100,000 people a year. And many of those people move to the epicenter of this area, which is our city of Toronto. So within the city, we're seeing a population growth of about 20,000 people a year. And where we see them move is directly correlated to our land use policy. So this is the zoning map for Toronto. Uh, it's important to note that the pale yellow area is what's known as R zoning, basically half of the city, which is designated to only have low rise single family use homes. Uh, so when we start to track where population growth occurs in our city, um, the next map should show us the census tracts uh, in Toronto where we have growing population. Now, there's no coincidence that each of these areas has a growing population because we have a land use policy that allows for mid-rise or high-rise typologies to exist. So the next map will indicate specifically the areas where those policies exist. Um, any new Torontonians are more or less moving into those uh, mid and high-rise typologies. And that's where population growth is occurring, which makes sense. But what doesn't make sense is when we look at the, zone, the census tracts for most of the city, these are all the areas where we actually have shrinking populations. Some of these areas have stagnant populations. Most of them have declining populations. And these all correlate directly to low rise housing zoning policies. And this has created something that planning nerds call the yellow belt. So where the green belt is protecting natural land around our region, the yellow belt is in some ways doing that. Uh, this is where the majority of our urban tree canopy exists, uh, as well as our parks and other types of open space uses that we do want to protect. But it does not make sense that our population is growing so rapidly but more than half of our land area actually has a shrinking population. The whole tall and sprawl approach of Toronto is something that is on the out and it's been on the out for quite a while. Uh, we've seen it with secondary unit policies inside of houses and now we're especially seeing it with what's known as missing middle housing. Uh, now laneway suites and garden suites are something that we like to call the missing little. So they're something that is specifically designed to go into existing neighborhoods and be a very gentle way of intensifying those areas while also protecting tree canopy and not infringing on parks or creating any kind of uh, offensive massing. Uh, currently, laneway suites alone are accommodating about 2% of Toronto's population growth every year. We're hoping that that's going to keep accelerating now the garden suites are in play and we'll start to see this type of housing really start to take control of accommodating that new population we're experiencing. What's most exciting to me is that the missing little is something that is built by and for homeowners. Like this is not something that really appeals to developers because it's so small scale. So it's pretty exciting to see like the people who are most affected by new housing starts uh, start to become those who are pushing it forward. So to clarify the typology, Laneway and garden suites are really very similar to a basement apartment, except they're just at the back of your property. It's pretty much that simple. Services all come from the main house. So wherever your gas, water, uh, and mail delivery come currently, those stay there and it's up to the homeowner to branch them back to the ADU. And because of that, they're not severable. So you're never going to be able to take that new dwelling and sever it onto its own individual piece of land. It will always be sold with the main house. And the coolest part, like I mentioned, is that this is a policy that was created by stakeholders for stakeholders. So not only are homeowners the ones benefiting from this, they're the ones that really offered it. 
uh, our group and the city of Toronto really push for a lot of outreach with both of these policies, uh, which is, I think, the main reason they're such a success. So to sort of cap it all off, ADUs are a great way to gently densify low-rise neighborhoods, or at least keep their population stagnant. Uh, they're making great use of space that we were really forgetting before and giving us new typologies of housing that are helping renters finally have options that are close to parks and schools and are essentially detached houses that are attractive to families. Um, and I think, I think that pretty much sums it up. So Tony, I'll throw it over to you to dive into the bylaws. Right. <laughs> So uh, now that we're doing both laneway and garden suites uh, in one, this is a pretty dense, uh, dense part of the conversation, part of the presentation. But uh, I'll try to go as uh, as slowly and as clearly as possible. Um, <clears throat> we're going to sort of start by an overall. I mean, uh, there are a lot of commonalities between the two policies. I mean, the, the garden suite policy itself was based on the successes of the laneway suite policy. But obviously, uh, uh, tweaked a little bit in order to account to uh, account for the the, the unique nature of uh, abutting three neighbors' lots instead of two. Um, so in both cases, uh, these are what are called as of right policies or as of right permissions, meaning that uh, if you wanted to build a laneway suite or a garden suite, uh, you don't need to go to committee of adjustment. You don't need to secure any special permissions, and uh, you would not be open to the objection of neighbors, um, for better or for worse. Um, as so long as you comply with the regulations. Um, these units are exempt from development charges. So for those of you who don't know, uh, whenever you add a unit or add square footage to a building in the city, uh, there is a levy uh, applied um, for residential units. Um, that can be upwards of $35,000 for a single bedroom unit. It's close to $50,000 for a two bedroom unit. Now, laneway and garden suites are exempt from those charges. Uh, there are affordable housing incentives available um, at the municipal level and at the provincial level. Uh, municipally, there is a $50,000 forgivable loan available uh, so long as you tie your uh, your rent rate to mar at or below market rent for 15 years. Um, there are tax rebates available through the CRA through two separate programs, uh, one geared to multi-generational family living, another geared to uh, purpose-built rental. Uh, vehicular parking is not required for either one of these types of units. So if you were to build a laneway suite, for example, all vehicular parking requirements for the entire property go away. Um, now, this was a point, a, a little bit of a sticking point with some stakeholders uh, when the policy was first introduced, but the city's planning staff put together a report in, uh, and presented that in late August of last year and actually showed that a uh, very few uh, laneway suites had any impact on parking uh, uh, congestion in, uh, in, uh, in key neighborhoods in the city. And garden suites uh, will not require parking space for that unit. Uh, the main house will require uh, the same parking requirements as it currently does though. Um, and neither one of these typologies will count towards your lot density or lot coverage calculation. It's kind of a no brainer because um, bottom line, I mean, 90% of the properties in the city, if you were to add any density to them, you'd be immediately going to be going to the committee of adjustment just the way our policies are written. Um, so the, I always call these free density in that respect. Um, now, I'll sort of, really, I sort of touched on this when we first started the conversation, but um, the homeowners that we work with fall into at least one of these three buckets. Um, and we'll launch a quick poll here, uh, again, just to sort of tailor our next part of the conversation. Um, Asking, I mean, what would be your use case for a laneway or garden suite? Um, I would say with laneway suites, we found that about two thirds of our of our builds are being built uh, yeah, as long term rentals. Um, they're both to offset mortgage uh, mortgage rates of average homeowners that live in the main house. Uh, some of our clients are serial investors, or I call career landlords. Um, really, they create quite a bit of value. Um, a growing section of our client base are multi-generational uh, homeowners uh, looking to house adult children or to, uh, to sort of um, have in-laws age in place. Um, I find that a lot of our garden suite inquiries are uh, really geared toward multi-generational living. Um, 
So I would say uh, garden suites at first glance, I would say about two thirds of our garden suites will be built for family, whereas two thirds of laneway suites are built for income. And then another growing cohort is uh, the live work flex space, sort of um, obviously with us living or uh, working from home and uh, being in close quarters with uh, family and kids, um, as uh, Craig had noted before. Um, we, I mean, a lot of our homeowners are looking to build home office space, playrooms, uh, guest houses, nanny suites, things of that nature, and really just improve overall housing flexibility. Um, so I'll share the poll real quick. So yeah, I mean, uh, the numbers check out. I mean, about two thirds for income or investment. Um, housing loved one, very common. And additional living space, I mean, uh, and obviously there's a combination of all of these things as well in many cases. Um, so diving right into the laneway suite requirements, sorry, skip the slide. The, I mean, your laneway suite is, uh, the laneway suite policy is written very clearly. I mean, uh, three key dimensions dictate what you can build. Um, the first is uh, you are required to provide a one meter setback from the laneway. Um, this is actually recently revised um, prior to January. This had to be 1.5 meters, about five feet. This is now reduced to about 38 inches. Um, your building height was also increased in January from six meters, which is just shy of 20 feet, to now just shy of 21 feet at 6.3. Your building can span lot line to lot line, zero setbacks on both sides. Um, under a few, in most conditions, um, so long as there are no unprotected openings, things like windows and doors in those two side walls. And uh, the building can be up to 10 meters in maximum depth. So let's say you had the biggest, baddest property and wanted to build the biggest, baddest laneway suite, uh, your maximum depth will always be that 10 meters unless you sought a variance at committee's adjustment. Works out to about 33 feet. Um, the one of the biggest questions that we always that we always get is this around this angular plane requirement. Um, we actually quite like this requirement. Uh, it's very successful uh, in terms of the laneway suite policy. This was built in to eliminate uh, to limit shadow and overlook onto neighboring properties. It's best considered as an imaginary plane set at seven and a half meters from the main house, and then you have an, a line projecting upward at four meters, about thirteen feet. Excuse me, and then about 40 at a, and then projecting backward at a 45 degree angle. So your building may not project through that angular plane um, except for this dormer, which I'll touch on in a moment. Now, if you're building a single story lane with suite, that can be reduced. Uh, the separation to five meters works out to about 16 feet. Um, now, in that case, I mean, uh, oftentimes it's very difficult to justify that investment financially, but uh, there are a few units that we've done uh, exploring a single unit with a or a single story with a basement. So on that note, shallower lots, uh, single story makes a lot of sense. Um, and taking that one step further to double up your available floor space, building a basement. Basements are completely permitted. That's a very common question that we get as well. They're just incredibly expensive, to be honest. Um, I mean, uh, we'll touch on that a little bit more in, later in the presentation. Uh, for mid-sized lots, uh, we're looking at a two-story unit with an angular plane, sort of situating the building at that minimum rear yard separation and then adhering tightly to the maximum zoning envelope with the building geometry. And in, in cases where we have substantial depth in the rear yard, we can actually locate the building further back from that minimum separation, completely clearing that angular plane requirement, which is kind of why I always say that that angular plane has to be considered an imaginary line. Um, that angular plane does not shift back with the building. It's fixed at that 7.5 meter separation. This is why in some cases you'll find lane which we have that angular roof line, other cases they don't. So on that same token, um, the laneway suite, like I said, can be built lot line to lot line, but to a maximum of eight meters in width. Works out to about 26 and in change, 26 feet in change. Um, so if you had a 40 foot wide lot, uh, you can still only build to that 26. You can sort of justify it to one side or the other, or put it dead center if you really wanted to. And that dormer projection through the angle of the roof line 
can be up to a maximum of 30% of the building width measured four meters above grade. So uh, this becomes a really great tool to uh, frame views um, sort of away from the main house um, or uh, sort of get it max a lot more daylight in that second building phase. Um, and quite frankly, to, to articulate the building geometry um, to create some visual interest as well. <clears throat> so uh, in exchange for this free density, uh, the what's left over on the property is subject to some pretty stringent soft landscaping requirements. Soft landscaping refers to uh, ground cover like uh, uh, sod, mulch, soil, believe it or not, pool surfaces. Uh, the water itself is soft landscaping. Um, hard landscaping would be things like decks, uh, patios, uh, paving, obviously. Um, so where you have a lot that's larger than a six meter frontage, it's about 20 feet. Um, your, your requirement is 85% of the rear yard between the rear wall of the main house and the front wall of the laneway suite must be soft landscaping. Where the, your lot is less than six meters in frontage, that is reduced to 60% soft landscaping. At the laneway side, in all cases, you must provide a minimum of 75% soft landscaping, excluding a, a, a driveway. So if you decided to, to maintain a garage in the structure, which is completely your prerogative, not required, uh, that driveway is not subject to that landscaping requirement. So a few other character elements to consider. Um, these are, there were some minor alterations to this from the previous bylaw recently as well. Um, first of all, you can have a, a patio or deck um, or a terrace, whatever you'd like to call it. Now that must uh, be on the laneway side. You cannot have a platform uh, that faces the side yard or the rear yard. Um, in this case, where one of the openings of that platform abuts the neighboring property, you have to provide a 1.5 meter high privacy screen. And that platform may not exceed 10% of the floor area. It also must be within the maximum zoning envelope. So the best way to look at this is for every square foot of patio or balcony you provide, it's one less square foot of interior floor space. Um, I saw a couple of questions. Uh, rooftop patios are not permitted in either structure for very obvious reasons um, in terms of overlook and access and building height. Um, there's nothing in the bylaw that says you can't access the roof to service mechanical equipment, et cetera, um, but you cannot, uh, it, you, you can't have a permanent fixed uh, a seating space. Um, so with that said, you can have roof equipment, uh, things like condensing units, uh, uh, photovoltaic panels, um, things of that nature, but those need to be set back from the roof perimeter by 1.5 meters minimum, and they may not exceed 1.5 meters beyond the building height. A recent technical small amendment that was made to the bylaw as well is that skylights may now project beyond the maximum building height by up to 0.3 meters, which now allows us to put skylights at any point, at, at any location on the, on the building, uh, which are a great tool to get lots of natural daylight deep into the floor plate on what is otherwise a very constraining footprint. Uh, Craig, I can take these ones really quick. Um, what about green roofs? Totally permitted, not advantageous in the eyes of the zoning bylaw, but uh, if you want one, you can do it. Our, Solar panels permitted, those are photovoltaics, PV panels. Yes, absolutely. Um, we just find that given the limited square footage available for PVs to be installed, um, it, it often is not worthwhile financially, um, but with evolving technology and perhaps combining a PV install with the main house roof, uh, there's a lot of potential there. And then C asked, will we get a cost breakdown? You guys are eager. Yes, we're about, 20% through the, through the presentation, so sit tight. So the last uh, sort of mo most um, uh, contentious item uh, around the laneway suite requirements is actually not a bylaw, a zoning bylaw requirement, it's a code requirement. It's providing emergency access to a laneway. The building code does not expressly address a building that does not face a street. So the city of Toronto had to come up with some, inter uh, some interesting requirements to, uh, to satisfy the principles of the building code, obviously making sure that these units are safe to occupy. So you have two options in the case of the laneway house or laneway suite. The first is access via the laneway itself. 
um, to a maximum of 90 meters to an abutting street or via the side yard to the front street to a maximum travel distance of 45 meters and a minimum clearance available of 0 0.9 meters. That's about three feet. So the 0 0.9 meter clearance is ideally between the house and the property line, though that can span across the property line, um, again, and basically between the two neighboring buildings, but you would need to enter into a mutual access agreement with your neighbor. So of course there would need to be some cooperation there. It adds some cost and some time to the process, but in oftentimes it's a, it's a linchpin in getting a blame misbeing on your property. And we, of course, help out with, uh, with uh, taking care of that whole process as well. <clears throat> so uh, for the laneway itself, um, your, for, for the laneway access route, uh, the best way to look at this is a fire truck is never going to go down a laneway itself. Uh, a fire truck will always pull up to a street curb and extend a, a hose in one direction to the fire, a hose in the other direction to a hydrant. Um, so that hose length may not exceed 45 meters in most cases. So here you have the pumper truck location at the street curb, 45 meters to the hydrant, and then 45 meters to the entrance way of the laneway suite. Now, last year, this was a small change was made where the laneway distance can be increased to 90 meters if you provide fire mitigating design provisions. So things, uh, you can uh, install a fire alarm and a sprinkler system, uh, or you can reduce your uh, permitted openings uh, by half. So for example, if you're permitted 60% window coverage on one side, that gets reduced to 30%, and then you add a fire alarm system and you no longer need sprinklers. So there's a few architectural ways that we can, that we can solve this as well. And then the second option, which is very similar to garden suites, is via a side yard setback. Um, not all properties provide this, um, but uh, where the distance via the laneway is too long from the street, it's a great secondary option. And again, 45 meters from the pumper truck location to the entrance of the lane laneway suite at the rear yard, and then 45 meters from the pumper truck to the hydrant. I hope that's clear. All right. Now onto the garden suites. The, okay, so the setback and separation requirements for a garden suite are based on the lane width. Um, so the separation for the rear yard, uh, five meters for a single story unit or seven and a half meters for a two story unit is identical to the requirements for a lane width suite. Now, the big difference here is that the, the garden suite is required setbacks from the two side lot lines. Whereas a laneway suite can go lot line to lot line, a garden suite has to pull in. So the high level difference between these two bylaws are that the laneway suite policy is very straightforward. Um, I always tell people three dimensions on your property and we can tell you exactly what you can build. Now with the garden suite policies, there's a lot of if and or buts built into it. And that's very strategic because the garden suite policy is written to acknowledge many different types of properties across the entire city. Um, I mean, of course, laneways geographically are con concentrated to the downtown core and the periphery, whereas garden suites literally apply citywide, whether it's Scarborough, Etobicoke, North York, a uh, 15-foot lot in the annex or a 50-foot lot in, uh, in Don Mills. So um, it's not as straightforward. Uh, I always say instead of develop, instead of understanding your buildable footprint, uh, it's your developable area. Okay, so where your building could reside within the confines of your property, not exactly what your building size will be. So the side yard setback is a perfect example. Um, a side yard setback is a minimum of 0 0.6 meters, so two feet, um, but is also calculated as 10% of your lot frontage. So if you have a 10 meter lot frontage, your side yard setback must be one meter on each side. Your rear yard setback is a minimum of 1.5 meters, about five feet. And that increases to three meters where your lot is deeper than 45 meters. We also have a really great blog on our website um, that details all of these provisions. Highly recommend taking a look at that. Um, and if you have any other questions on the intricacies of this, uh, send us an email.
The uh, lot coverage, likewise, there's three conditions. Um, one thing that is a big takeaway from this is the maximum size of a garden suite is 60 meters squared, regardless of the size of your property and the conditions of your property. The maximum size of a laneway suite is 80 meters squared. So a laneway suite can be slightly larger, but the difference being is that the laneway suite size is dictated by that eight meter width by 10 meter depth. In the case of the garden suite policy, that 60 meters squared does not limit depth or length. So you can build something long and skinny, short and fat. Uh, so it really, it allows for that flexibility and acknowledging different lot conditions. Um, and then there's sort of secondary requirements here. Um, you may not exceed 40% of the rear yard area, even if you're less than 60 meters squared or you may not exceed 20% of the total lot area combining other ancillary structures. So a garden suite can be built and you can have a shed on the property as well, a greenhouse or, uh, or a detached garage, but the combination of all those ancillary structures may not exceed 20% of your overall lot area. So building height uh, is six meters. Uh, you can build two stories. Two stories is the maximum. And again, garden suites can have basements, just incredibly expensive. Um, and of course, you can build a single story garden suite as well. Uh, so that six meter height restriction is uh, just shy of that 20 feet. Um, you are now subject to not only the angular plane on the front wall, like with a laneway suite, but you're subject to an angular plane on the other three sides as well. So this is going back to my original point of this imaginary line. If you can set your, your garden suite back further than the minimum required setback to a point where you're avoiding that angular roof line, you can actually build straight up. So this again comes into sort of being creative with how you leverage your property relative to the bylaws. Um, a lot of times we're not going to build to that minimum setback on all three sides. Uh, so then we can maximize volume at that second floor uh, or uh, sort of avoid awkward angular roof lines and junctions that, uh, that don't perform well. So just to cap that off, the angular plane is tied to the minimum setback. Uh, just like with the lane with feet, uh, you are permitted to have balconies. Um, I mean, the bylaws always call these platforms. A platform on the second floor may not be more than four meters above grade. Again, you do require that 1.5 meter high privacy barrier when facing an adjacent property. And just like with a laneway suite, it may not exceed 10% of the interior floor area. You can project with at grade platforms as well to a maximum of one and a half meters into the, into the rear yard. So long as that is no higher than a, a foot above grade, 0.3 meters. Landscaping, again, just like the lane with suite bylaw, <clears throat> there are soft landscaping requirements. Now, the difference here being that, um, of course, there's an either or. Um, the rear yard cannot be any less than 50% soft landscaping, including the footprint of the garden suite. So with laneway suites, it separates the rear yard between the two buildings and then the laneway setback. In this case, it's factoring in the entire backyard, including the footprint of the garden suite. And the alternative is the entire property may not exceed, may not be less than 25% soft landscaping. So this is actually a good thing because if you have a large front yard that's predominantly soft landscaping, that can often offset your lack of soft landscaping in the rear and vice versa. <clears throat> and again, very similar to laneway suites, you are required to have an access route from the front to the main to the principal entrance for emergency services. This may not exceed 45 meters from the curb. Right now, the city has required a one meter uh, wide access route, uh, whereas laneway suites need 0.9. I believe that this is going to be revised in the final version of the bylaw to match the laneway suites at 0 0.9 meters. That was a directive made by council in the final approvals. Now that remains to be seen. Um, the other piece to this to consider is a lot of homeowners will say, I mean, I have just barely one meter. Um, that means I qualify. 
I mean, that's great, but we also want to consider access for logistics during construction, um, getting machinery, equipment, materials to the rear yard. This access route is critical. Um, so in cases where you may just barely satisfy that one meter access between houses, I mean, we may be able to satisfy the requirements, but actually executing the work will be extremely costly and difficult. So we also want to be thinking of the logistics of actually executing the project as well. All right, I'll take a quick breather here. Um, shall I answer a few quick questions, Craig? Sure, uh, there are a lot of them. We might wanna hang on to them to the end. Um, yeah. So typically Tony and I will try to get through the slideshow and then mm -hmm. at the end, we'll stick around for as many questions as everyone has. Um, mm -hmm. So let's maybe keep trucking. I'll try to type answers as we go and uh, then we'll save these for the end. Sounds good, I caught my breath already. All right, let's do this. Um, so we're going to dive into the process. Um, so really, we break this down into three phases, but there's always a phase zero, regardless of who you're working with. Um, we, we always encourage everybody we work with, do your due diligence, speak with as many service providers as you can in the industry, whether they be builders, architects, designers, or whomever in between. Um, consult Facebook groups, uh, but obviously take some advice with grain of salt. But I mean, my my big point here, and Craig's big point, is uh, use as much free information as possible. Um, understand the challenges and opportunities as they pertain to your property. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of service providers will provide free resources. I mean, we do free property reports. I mean, a few of you, I believe, have already reached out to us on these, but we actually prepare this for every inquiry that we get. Um, so. Again, completely free, no site visit required, no obligation whatsoever. Send us an email with your address. If you have a survey, that's great, but not necessary. And we'll turn around a property report like this within a few hours. This will uh, demonstrate whether you are eligible. Uh, it'll have a, a few example floor plans and example projects of a similar size and nature, and then a summary of our process. And then likewise for garden suites, we just rolled this out last month. Uh, they were a hit. Um, so, I mean, send us your address and we'll, again, turn around a completely free report, confirming your eligibility on approximate size, and then with a lot more detail on the bylaw requirements as well. And again, this we do this all day, every day. Um, send us an email to info at landscape.ca and we're happy to provide that. So, once you have a degree of comfort uh, with what you can achieve, um, and a degree of comfort in the, the information that you've collected. Uh, this is where we always recommend starting with preliminary design. This is really the toes in the water approach. Um, low financial commitment, uh, understand the push and pull of the bylaws, start putting some pen to paper on exactly what can apply to your property and cross-referencing with your use case um, and your sort of program, your key priorities, your warrants, your must-haves and uh, pull together some realistic numbers, both in terms of costing, in terms of revenue and value gain. So we do a preliminary design document for both laneway and garden suites. We'll put together a site plan that uh, manipulates things like parking, privacy, access, um, understanding challenges and opportunities like protected trees, um, topography, <clears throat> and things of that nature. And we'll put together some floor plans as well. I sort of, go ahead. Uh, I need to go deal with the child. I'll be right back, Tony. No problem, duty calls. Uh, so, I mean, uh, floor plans, uh, I always liken these to like a condo sales plan. I mean, they're dimensioned, there's fixtures laid out. Uh, of course, you can't get a permit with these, but at least we understand uh, what we can achieve at a macro level and from the inside out, um, making sure that the envelope that we're able to build uh, can accommodate what we're looking to incorporate. <clears throat> and likewise, we'll put together a, um, we, we, we always put together a, a schedule. Um, so we start by uh, sort of working through the different phases of the design and approval, but then we also sort of break that down obviously into, into allocated like timelines that are specific to your project. So the second part is design and approvals. I'll sort of speed this up a little bit. Design and approvals are where we get into the nitty gritty. Uh, you're comfortable with the size, the nature of the budget, ready to get designing. 
So we start with the zoning certificate. So this is a zoning review um, drawing set that describes the size, shape, and location of the building, confirming conformance with the bylaws. We receive a zoning certificate from the city, which expedites our permits down the line, and also gives you peace of mind to continue investing time, effort, and money into the project. Then we'll work through schematic design. We sort of develop multiple options uh, at every stage, not only at the preliminary design stage, but from the exterior design and right through on the interiors. Then we'll land on a final finished product, um, sort of working that through in our modeling software. And we'll materialize that. So we start to work through construction drawings, uh, identifying materials, assemblies, building systems, lighting, switching, you name it. Um, really getting down into that granular level of detail uh, in order to uh, actually not only get a permit, but actually collect pricing that is accurate and, uh, and execute the project. We also work through all interior finishes. Um, so with most clients, we will develop interior renderings specifying things like flooring, countertops, backsplashes, tile, uh, fixtures uh, throughout. And then of course, uh, we'll develop permit drawings and tender, permit tender and construction drawings. Whenever I uh, speak with a homeowner and they're in the due diligence phase, I always recommend ask for examples of deliverables from everybody that you're speaking with. Even to the untrained eye, you will immediately see the quality of work and the pride that they take in what they prepare. Um, so for us, we, we take just as much pride in our construction documents as we do in our renderings that we post on Instagram. Um, that's why we've been successful thus far. That's why we have well-executed builds on time and on budget. And that's why our clients like us. Likewise with our details. I mean, the way that we believe in working is, um, strategic investments in terms of time and some small costs here and there to make a big impact. Um, low cost, high reward. That's how we work. Um, it costs nothing to put time and effort into uh, resolving details and into communicating those effectively. Um, it doesn't, we don't believe in attaching windmills and solar panels to our buildings in order to make them responsible. Uh, we believe in conservation, not in preservation instead of uh, generation. And again, working right through to those interior layouts, uh, coordinating bulkheads, finish tags, you name it. So construction, I'm gonna do the service connections, Craig, and then maybe I'll pitch it over to you. Cool. So I saw there was a couple questions here about service connections. Um, this is another very common question. <clears throat> the um, laneway and garden suite are both connected the exact same way. Uh, so there's four key service, services that run to the back, hydro, gas, water, and then your sanitary line. So wastewater going back out to the street. Hydro, believe it or not, is the most straightforward. Hydro, uh, you can have a separate meter for the laneway suite. Usually what we'll do is we'll upgrade to a 200 amp service coming in from the street. We'll separate that to two separate meters, 100 amps for the main house, 100 amps for the laneway or garden suite. So the two of them have separate accounts, they're paid independently, and uh, everybody's happy. Now, in some cases where you have a triplex, fourplex, sixplex in the main house, uh, you may need a higher amperage service in order to accommodate that. That's when you're getting into big significant costs, upgrading to a 400, 400 amp service from Toronto Hydro, usually not required, but we look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. Gas and water are connected in very similar ways you cannot separately meter your gas or your water. You can put check meters or usage meters on those lines, meaning uh, it'll remotely read a certain amount of usage to a certain area, but you will not have a separate account or a separate bill from Enbridge or from Toronto, Toronto Water, sorry. Um, all of these services are run in a trench in the backyard. And that brings me to your wastewater line, which is potentially the most disruptive. The wastewater line is always connected either at the basement level at the closest available stack or a floor drain, or it can be connected at the front yard in front of the house before it outgoes to the street. So one thing just to be abundantly clear on is laneway and garden suites cannot have separate services, only one line per property. 
So that's why these are intended for rentals and that's why they're non-severable. They cannot be sold separately. So your sanitary connection uh, can be relatively disruptive at the basement. So we always want to be considerate of um, basement tenants, the finish level of that basement. We want to think about uh, the access on the outside. Where is it best to core through the walls? Um, and it, if at all, and then we also want to coordinate timing. These services don't have to be done at any particular phase in the project. Ideally, they're done early, but we can do them at any point to accommodate your tenants or whomever else may be in the main house. So for a couple of weeks, the backyard will be a bit of a war zone, just being blunt on that, but it's well worth it. Uh, working with a good contractor and a good consultant, um, these things can be planned well in advance and uh, will be pretty painless process when, once we get boots on the ground. Talk to you, Craig. Thanks, Tony. Um, when we design the structure for our suites, uh, it's rare that these have basements. It is possible to build basements, but typically we're designing a slab on grade condition. Uh, in general, we use standard stick build construction. So it's really very common construction practices just on a smaller house than you typically see. So this is an example of one of our slab on grades. Uh, if we have living space on the ground floor, the slab is very thoroughly insulated and we have in slab heating to make sure that it's comfortable for the occupants. Um, keep firing through these, Tony. So in the event where we do have a basement, uh, it is often uh, required that we shore the sides of your site. Uh, so that can often lead to basements being quite expensive. Um, so it's rarely worth it for a rental unit, but often worth it if you're moving yourself or a loved one in and you just want the space. Uh, when we do construct on a zero lot line, which is pretty much always the case with a laneway suite, that means you're building right up against your neighbor's property. Uh, we'll have to design the house so that we can tilt up the walls. So this is an example of one of our builders actually put on all the weather barriers, the exterior insulation and the cladding so that when he tilts the wall up, it's completely built and he can just build from the inside going forward. Uh, that's less of a concern with garden suites, but kind of a trick of the trade for laneway suites. And similarly, uh, especially on laneways, but garden suites too, space is at a massive premium. Uh, we really have to be strategic about where we have staging areas for things like bins and large material deliveries. Uh, the image on the right, one of our builders actually orders his lumber in reverse order. So he gets them to stack it in the yard for the things he's going to need last on the bottom and the things he needs immediately on the top. That kind of logistical insight is really valuable. Um, it's worth mentioning we at Lanescape, we only do design and approvals, but we do have builders we can connect you with or work with your builders. And we stay involved throughout construction, like a typical construction administrator, just or like an architect, I should say, just ensuring that the design is executed to the, to the drawings. Construction is executed to the design. When it comes to our building envelope, uh, we do try to focus on exceeding the building code in terms of our energy performance. Uh, that is useful for ensuring that we minimize the carbon footprint of our buildings, um, but we find it's particularly impactful on comfort and quality for our houses. Um, you can see here we have like a smart vapor retarder uh, instead of just typical poly, which allows the wall assembly to be more vapor open and breathe, which minimizes the, uh, the likelihood of mildew and mold growing. Uh, the image on the left shows how we tape the seams of our sheathing to get a really airtight building envelope. That's something that not a lot of people focus on. Airtightness is the biggest bang for your buck in terms of minimizing energy consumption and increasing comfort. It costs very little to perform or to create a very airtight assembly, but it gives you huge efficiency gains and comfort boosts. Uh, we always specify exterior insulation. The building code does require this now as a minimum standard. For our clients who are really focused on energy efficiency, we can fine tune this to use thicker than minimum uh, dimensions. And by putting the extra insulation on the outside of the structure, 
that really benefits our thermal bridging and minimizes the amount of heat loss through structure. So it's a, a really effective way to comply with the building code and then fine tune to your energy needs based on what your program requirements are. <clears throat> when it comes to our roof, really any horizontal assembly, roof floor or slab on grade, uh, size is your enemy. So we want to design those assemblies to be as thin as possible. Our roofs are a place where we focus on actually not using exterior insulation, which is something we would normally do when height is less of a factor. But here we don't want to lose uh, the headroom that's so precious in these structures. So we employ what's called a flash and bat uh, methodology, where we use a thin layer of spray foam on the underside of the roof sheathing that helps give us uh, good airtight construction. And then we fill the remainder of the joist cavity with bat insulation that allows us to run wiring and plumbing and things like that through the cavity, uh, but still get that high performance we want out of an otherwise very thin assembly. <clears throat> Windows and doors are something that on a laneway suite almost design themselves. Uh, they tend to only be allowed on the front and the back because that's where you don't have a lot line. Uh, but we do work with our clients to fine tune where those windows are located based on the use case. So for example, if I want to put a tenant in my laneway suite, I probably don't want them having a lot of windows staring into my backyard that I'm going to use as the person in the main house. Conversely, if I'm putting my grandma back there or I'm using it as a home office, I probably want a lot of windows connecting the laneway suite to the backyard and probably fewer facing the laneway so I can be more open to my own property and private from the neighbors. <clears throat> um, HVAC is something that's also really size dependent in laneway suites. Again, we don't want big bulkheads because headroom is so precious. And we just don't have space for large mechanical closets because we don't have basements. Uh, most of our projects will use some kind of in-floor radiant heating, uh, which I can go on the next slide. So like I said, when we're doing a slab on grade construction, having the slab feel warm if you have living space on the ground floor is really important. They do feel quite cold, even if they're well insulated. So to have a good quality space, um, it's important that we actually heat the slab but also it's extremely space efficient. We don't need any ductwork uh, to keep the space warm when we have a heated slab. So we can put all of our mechanical equipment into just a three foot by three foot closet and have very minimal, if, not, if any duct uh, bulkheads throughout the space. Uh, most of our projects will use a forced air system that is just a typical furnace that we put in the closet. These are especially suitable on our larger laneway and garden suite projects because we have space for some bulkheads and closets. Um, and it's the most cost efficient and comfortable system that we can specify. Uh, but where space is a real concern, we'll use what's called an air source heat pump system that can be hidden in joist cavities and other areas that use a lot less space. You want to go to the next slide there, Tony? So this is an example of an air source heat pump system we can actually fit in between floor joists. You see the image on the left. Um, so we can hide that inside of structure. And all we need to run to these systems are just refrigerant lines. So that's those thin white lines that we can easily snake through structural cavities and eliminate all bulkheads. Uh, when it comes to finishing, this is another thing that's really dependent on use case. Um, if you have a tenant that you're moving in, uh, you probably want to focus on durability over luxury. Whereas if it's grandma or home office, you may want to splurge on some finer finishes. The, so this is an example of a project where this is just an Ikea kitchen. Uh, generally, like what I would call basic finishes that just focus on being durable and quality over luxury. Um, but we can still dress them up to look great and be very attractive to tenants. Um, this is one that's a little more premium, but again, like we can run the gamut with these. Uh, and it's also an area where we can flex the budget quite a lot. Um, like selecting the right finish and bathroom vanities is going to flex your budget by possibly tens of thousands of dollars. So it's an easy place to value engineer 
um, or really invest in something if you're trying to go for a really high uh, rent rate from your tenant. So the one thing that I want to leave everybody in the group with is always consider, uh, like, I mean, when you're considering moving forward with a project like this, make it yours. Um, ask yourself, what's your use case? Does that change over a period of time? Uh, determine your performance goals. And I'm not just saying uh, 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 thermal R values on your exterior built, uh, envelope or uh, energy conservation. Um, I mean, what are your, what's your metrics in to, to evaluate a successful project? Is it financial gains? Is it something that's beautiful? Is it a combination of all the above? Um, understand what your budget is, obviously. Be realistic with your budget. I'm gonna hone in on this for a second, if you don't mind. A lot of homeowners speak with a contractor and a contractor says, no problem, we'll build it for $200 a square foot. That contractor has never built a lane with suite before, never built a garden suite before. That contractor is not including taxes, contingency, servicing, soft costs like engineering, consulting, permit fees, surveys, grading plans. Make sure you're speaking with an experienced professional, collecting all of the information you possibly can. There are way too many people that come to us that say, I proceeded, I'm four months down the line with a builder that told me this was going to be $200 per square foot, and it is now $400 per square foot. Um, you don't want to get yourself in that situation. I don't mean to scare anybody. But what it is, is collect as much information as you can and be realistic with your expectations. Yeah, I would spend that to include what's your upside? Because, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the cost of a lane base suite can be surprising. When you put it into context uh, with the revenue potential of a lane base suite, like we've never drawn up a pro forma that didn't make financial sense and mm -hmm. wasn't cash flow positive from day one. Like, if you're gonna, if you're scared by investing in real estate, you shouldn't do it. If you want to do it, this is the best way. Absolutely. Yeah, and the last thing is uh, understand the principles behind your priorities. A lot of times, homeowners will say, uh, "I don't want any windows on my back on the on facing my backyard." Is that because you don't like daylight? Is that because you don't want to be looking at the tenant? Is that because you want privacy? understand how we can resolve those things architecturally uh, instead of jumping to conclusions. And those are the, how the best projects evolve, um, sort of working together as a team to, uh, to, be, uh, to, to really explore many options throughout the entire process and, uh, and really looking at this critically at every stage. Um, so a few quick uh, money shots, I guess, of our projects we'll flip through. And if anybody has any questions, we're happy to stick around and answer. If anybody has to go, thank you very much for joining us. It's our first combined laneway and garden suite webinar. So we ran a little bit over time, uh, but I think it went kind of smooth. I have to go. My kids keep waking up. I need a laneway suite to go walk them in there or a garden suite now. No problem. If you have to go, I can stick around and, and uh, take care of the questions, Chris. I'm just going to let them kind of run around while we finish up here. Everyone in the audience is more important than my kids right now. So we'll, we'll stick to business. So if, and it, you know, thanks so much for joining. If anyone has to get off to bed, uh, feel free to reach out to us, send your address to info at landscape.ca and we'll send you a free property assessment. Anyone with questions, please type them into the, the chat, uh, the Q and A, and Tony and I'll stick around and answer them all. Uh, you can also raise your hand if you really wanna ask it in person. Uh, typed is usually easier. <clears throat> Uh, so the first question is, would a carport or overhang on a garden suite count as part of the square footage? Uh, so it wouldn't count as part of the square footage, but does count as a projection, and those are limited in their size. Uh, you would be chewing up a lot of usable space to accommodate a carport. So um, if you're okay with that, that's doable, but usually carports are um, not always advisable, especially with a lineway suite. Jen asks, is our construction loans available? Um, I mean, yes. Um, most homeowners that we work with uh, are financing their projects either through a home equity line of credit, uh, our construction loan or cash, uh, cash investments from elsewhere, um, or a combination of all of the above. Um, construction loans uh, typically will have a higher interest rate than a home equity line of credit, um, and will have some additional strings attached. Um, 
we are we unfortunately are not mortgage brokers or uh, or uh, financial professionals, but uh, we're happy to put you in touch with a few contacts that we've had success with in past. Hey, someone's asking what is what are the costs of upgrade to a 200 amp or 400 amp service? So, mm -hmm. 200 amps is usually required when you have multiple units on a property, and the cost for that is a few thousand dollars. It's fairly uh, reasonable. If you already have like a triplex in your main house and you want to build a lane layer or garden suite, then you probably have to get up to 400 amps. And that is usually fairly expensive because that's a commercial service. It has to come underground. Um, there are a lot more accommodations to deal with. So um, that's very site specific. It can be expensive, but uh, you know, again, if you're getting to like the fifth, sixth, or the seventh unit on your property, you're not too concerned about it. I've seen between forty and sixty thousand dollars from Toronto Hydro for that. Um, Leo asks, how about pre-existing structures for a garden suite and requirements for setbacks? So both laneway and the garden suite bylaws permit an existing structure to be maintained, um, even if it does not conform to the required setbacks. So if your existing garage is closer to a rear or a side lot line than what is required, you can keep it. Um, however, any new construction being a second story addition or expansion of that garage structure has to conform with the setbacks. So you'll see on our, on our website, there are a few laneway suites where we've done that. Um, I do caution homeowners that uh, maintaining an existing structure uh, does not necessarily save a lot of money. I mean, you may see between five and 10% savings on a typical project by doing that. Um, really where it makes sense to maintain the existing footprint is spatially, not financially. So if you can gain additional square footage by doing so, I would recommend it. Um, but I mean, it's totally situation. Uh, Churchill asks, regarding garden suite, what are the constraints with a shared driveway? Sorry if I missed that, no worries. The, uh, yeah, I mean, with a shared driveway, um, there aren't really any bylaw constraints in terms of uh, your garden suite itself. Your garden suite just cannot be on a shared right of way or an easement. Um, your access, your emergency service access must be within your side of that easement measured between the property line and your main house. Um, but aside from that, there aren't really any uh, regu regulatory constraints. But if you have a survey, send it our way. We're happy to take a look and provide a report. The next question is, are there restrictions on where windows are located on a garden suite? So yes, um, there are zoning implications for setbacks if you have windows located on certain sides. There are also building code requirements because you have to have a certain distance between the face of your building and the lot line or another structure. Um, that determines how big your windows can be. So the quick answer is that there are tons of restrictions and that's why you need to hire an architect. <laughs> and Anonymous asks, how long does construction take to complete? Um, construction totally depends, complexity, access, time of the year, how good your contractor is. With our builders, uh, usually it's between six and eight months, even in today's climate. A lot of homeowners uh, are concerned over delays with supply chain issues or, uh, or I mean, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, I mean, uh, stretched thin co uh, contractors. I mean, honestly, uh, we've seen some minor delays, but not nearly as much of an impact as you would read about in the media. Uh, we work with good builders, good planners, and we have a good consulting team. Um, so we protect against that. So the next question from Stuart is, uh, how does the cost of language suite compare to the cost to build a primary dwelling? That, so my answer as a developer is that it costs way less. Uh, the construction cost is same on a cost per square foot basis, like they're, they're very comparable. Where you see savings for a language suite is that presumably you already own the land. So if you're just putting this behind your house, like why not, the land's free. And also they are, have development charges deferred. So right off the bat, you're building a detached house. Like normally that would cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars in development charges, parks, levies, and other municipal fees. Those are deferred for Langley Suites indefinitely. So the administrative costs are substantially reduced. 
Uh, is it possible to have a two bedroom garden suite that is a single story within the 645 square foot max footprint? So for context, 645 square feet is that 60 meters squared maximum. Um, quick answer is that is a very tight two bedroom. Um, I'm more inclined to say that's a one bedroom plus den. Um, the other variable here is uh, in order to have a legal bedroom, you do need windows um, and uh, windows of a certain size. So that also comes down to if you can achieve two bedrooms on a building face that can have windows to Craig's point that he made uh, just a moment ago. Um, so, I mean, uh, I've seen 645 square foot two bedroom condos, not the best to live in, um, but it may be doable. <clears throat> Really, I mean, we're probably never going to do a one story garden suite. You can do a like one and a half story garden suite uh, very easily, like within the four meter permitted height. So you're kind of doing a basement, but it's half lifted out of the ground. Um, so really, even when your site is restricted to only like a four meter building height, we can still essentially get two stories into it and get you those two bedrooms without much problem. I'd like to take uh, this next one if you don't mind. By all means. Uh, how long is the design and construction process for a garden and a laneway suite? Laneway suite right now for a straightforward project, design four to five months. Uh, that's from point of engagement. You have a survey and you'd like to move forward with design to a point in which we have, a, uh, we have permits and you're ready to start construction. Construction is between six and eight months, again, for a straightforward project. If you're going through things like committee of adjustment, if you're seeking uh, tree removal uh, with parks and forestry, et cetera, expect there to be substantial additions to that timeline. Most of our jobs are done within 14 months. I, we always target 12. Okay, which things can help us save on construction costs? Um, that's, I mean, the million dollar question, not like being quite literal. Uh, like finishes are the easy one. Really, you can't skimp on structure or your insulation or your mechanical systems. Like those are, we have a pretty robust building code here. It sets high minimum standards. So it's things like building a smaller structure. Like if you need to bring your cost down, like bringing your scope down is the easiest way to do that. Um, and also, I would just say build a laneway suite or a garden suite because, again, they're deferred from development charges and parkland dedications. So, off the bat, your construction cost is lower on this typology than any other type of construction. Okay. Um, but you want to take Matt's question there, Craig? It's probably better for you. Sure. It seems from all discussions that severing from the main lot is something that has been discouraged and disincentivized and is currently not permitted, full stop. Is there any likelihood that something built as a garden suite might one day be severable? I know this is a bit of a crystal ball question. So, I mean, there's no way it'll ever be severable. Like we can, we can move on to the next question, but for two reasons. One is that from a planning logic, it would not be realistic to go to the committee of adjustment and say, I have a house in my backyard that I wanna make on a separate lot. Like it wouldn't have frontage on the street or access to servicing. It would be an extremely, extremely rare condition where severance is something that would even be something you should entertain. Uh, and then also, like you mentioned, you're disincentivized from doing it. So the fact that you don't have to pay development charges and parkland dedication on ADUs is because you're agreeing to defer them as long as you don't sever them. So as soon as you seek a severance, your costs go way up. Um, it, it's really never going to happen unless you have an extremely rare case. Um, is there restrictions about corner lots? Um, I mean, so there's, I mean, I wouldn't call them restrictions. Um, the, I mean, so first of all, like garden suite, the garden suite policy, if you're on a corner lot that doesn't have a laneway, um, there are different setbacks required for how it faces the street. Um, but actually, the good thing about facing the street with the garden suite is uh, you don't need a, a negative plane requirement on that face. Um, so you can actually maximize usability on the second floor there. Um, now, if you have parking in the garden suite and it's facing a street, meaning a ground floor garage, uh, then there are very deep setbacks required for that. It increases from a 1.5 meter setback to like, I think it's six meter setback. So that oftentimes will pretty much make your lane, your garden suite unattainable. 
Um, and then in terms of uh, laneway suite, uh, I mean, it, it, the corner lot doesn't really affect it other than being able to get a third face of windows. Karina asks, can the windows be above eye level? Yes, absolutely. They can be anywhere you want. They can be on the roof. Um, the, the amount is limited by your limiting distance or your distance from lot lines and other structures. But where they go is up to your imagination. How about trees in the backyard? So this is something I really want to touch base on. At every stage of uh, approvals for the, by, for the garden suite bylaws, um, there was serious mention of uh, making sure that we're not affecting uh, mature trees that are existing. So Toronto Parks and Forestry will uh, protect, basically the private tree bylaw protects any tree that measures larger than 30 centimeters in diameter at 1.5 meters above grade. And uh, if your construction uh, is within the tree protection zone or requires the removal of that tree, you will need a permit to do so. Um, I can say fairly confidently, if you're building a garden suite and you need to remove a healthy, mature tree to do so, you're not going to get the approval. We recommend doing everything we possibly can to work around protected trees. Um, we're actually publishing a blog uh, tomorrow on uh, tree protection zones and how, uh, and how they will impact both the garden suites and laneway suites. If you don't already tune into our newsletter, recommend tuning into that. You'll have it in your inbox next week. Uh, next question is, are there any limitations or height restrictions for garden suites when you've met all the setback requirements stated in the bylaw? Uh, I mean, there is a bylaw requirement for height. Uh, so there is a height limitation that you will have to follow is six meters. Um, and yeah, to your point, the farther away you are from lot lines in the main house, the easier it becomes to reach that six meter height without various angular planes pinching in on your headroom. Um, so it does get easier on bigger lots, but no matter what, you're always limited to that six meter height. Now last, uh, what about excavating and building into a hill? Any insights there? Our backyard is on a slope upwards. Honestly, building on a hill is advantageous in terms of getting building height and having some creativity. Um, building height is calculated relative to what's called average grade. So if you have a high point and a low point at either side of your building, average grade is gonna be in the center and then your six meter height restriction is from there. So all of a sudden you can actually achieve additional ceiling height. You have some flexibility on where your ground floor or basement level sits relative to your ex exterior. And uh, honestly allows for some, some design freedom that, is, that, it, uh, make, that makes for some fun. Um, I mean, you may have a slightly additional cost depending on how much that slope is and if we need shoring or things like that. But usually, especially with a garden suite, we have the clearance that we can get away without it. Yeah, and really extremely sloping lots. Like we can kind of get a third story, so it can be awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, I have an existing garage structure, but setbacks are an issue. If I need to go to committee of adjustment, the percentage of approvals to meet requirements are low or high. Uh, if you had to go to committee of adjustment for any laneway design. Uh, so first of all, existing structures are permitted to exceed setback requirements, so you might not need committee anyway. Uh, send your address to info at landscape.ca, more verify. Uh, but uh, so far, we've had 100% success rate of committee of adjustment. I like to say you've won or lost committee of adjustment before you even show up. If you do the right outreach um, and you have a logical planning rationale behind your design, you should expect success at committee of adjustment. And frankly, we wouldn't take a project to committee that didn't have that in place. Um, so, you know, we'll have to see. Um, next one is, uh, I have a 17 and a half by 15 and a half garage structure from my perspective, well built, too small to be cost competitive for a modest studio, question mark. I mean, nothing's too small to be cost competitive. I mean, it's about being, it's, it's about being, um, it's about being resourceful. It's about uh, looking at this critically and uh, extracting the best value from what the circumstances offer. I mean, uh, I mean, that's not, I mean, we've built laneway suites that are smaller than that. Um, I mean, I would just temper expectations. We're not going to be fitting a family of four into this unit, but uh, at the same time, uh, there's a lot of ways to carve this. Uh, send us an email if you have a survey. Love to take a look.
yeah, often it's more advantageous to demolish it to get a larger structure that's still as of right, um, because your revenue will support doing that. Uh, but it can also be really easy to just slap some insulation in there and plug in a kitchen. Uh, okay, I have an unfinished basement that I plan on finishing. Should I not do that if my plan is to build a garden suite, considering the service connections? That is a great question. Uh, so you can absolutely go ahead and finish your basement, but include all the servicing roughens that would be necessary for a garden suite. Um, it's definitely advantageous if you can do it all at once. Um, that should also improve your cost, uh, as well as ease logistics. But if you're anxious to get it done, um, you can just plug in all the roughens and cap them uh, at the back of the house. Uh, to get a garden suite with a two bedroom, two bath, what square footage is realistic? Um, I hate to keep, I hate this answer too. It depends. Um, that, that angular roof line is really going to impact what's possible on that second floor. Um, if we were to hypothesize a straight up two story, um, sort of, uh, without angular planes, I'd venture to say, uh, 500 square feet per floor is, it would provide a really well-sized two bed, two bath with open concept living at grade. With that angular plane encroachment, you may need a little bit larger than that. Um, I mean, I highly recommend taking a look at some of the projects on our website. We can get pretty resourceful with space. Rob is asking, will the no development fees eventually change? Is there a time limit or expiration? So no, there is no time limit or expiration. In fact, there's hopefully gonna be uh, pressure or policy from the provincial level, uh, actually alleviating development charges for all kinds of small residential development. So if anything, I see it getting easier to avoid them rather than more restrictive. Uh, Eddie, uh, do you utilize equipment like heating, cooling, inverters instead of using traditional HVAC systems? Um, I mean, yeah, so we went through this in the presentation. Uh, we use hydronic radiant heat in our slabs in most cases. Um, in compact builds, we'll use air-to-air uh, -air heat pumps, um, whether they're wall-mounted, uh, ceiling concealed, or ducted units. Uh, we really like the Mitsubishi Mr. Slim series, for example. Um, they're super effective, really spatially efficient. Um, and we use low, I mean, we do use some forced air systems when we have two bedrooms plus. Okay, my garage for the primary house is 22 feet. Can I build a landway suite on top of my garage since the garage is already there? Uh, so yes, you can. Any new construction uh, will have to be beyond the angular plane requirements. Um, but that's right, Tony, isn't it? That the existing garage can encroach on the setback from the main house without issue. No, actually. So yeah. that that's why the so the, that's why I always say there's setbacks and then there's a separation. Setbacks are from the two side lot lines and the rear lot line. Your separation is from the rear wall of the main house to the front wall of the garden suite or the lane main suite. So but we've gotten uh, we've hit this snag in a few case in a few instances in the past where we've had an existing structure that is, let's say six meters from the main house. And we're, even though we're setting back the second story to seven and a half meters, that six meter separation from the existing building still triggers a variance. So if your existing structure is not more than seven and a half meters from the main house, you may not keep it. Right, and 22 feet is less than seven and a half meters. <laughs> so I have to shave two feet off your garage. Nailed it. Um, KD says uh, lots of numbers to keep track of. Is the max height for laneway suites and garden suites the same? No. So laneway suites are 6.3 meters, just shy of 21 feet. And then garden suites are six meters, just shy of 20 feet. Uh, we have uh, the bylaws and all these diagrams that you saw, they're on our website as well. Feel free to take a look. I mean, if you ever lose track of the numbers, they're all there. And if you want to know why they're different, so do we. So if you find out, tell us. Uh, next question is, in your experience, is adding skylights to maximize natural light at a significant cost of the project? Are there other considerations once you keep in mind to maximize natural light without getting into expensive options such as accordion style patio doors? Uh, so 
uh, skylights are a great way to do that. We find the laneway garden suites are small enough that uh, just windows and walls have enough light penetration to get really good daylighting throughout an entire structure. The only place it might, uh, we might have to do a skylight is if we're facing an angular plane, um, in which case you want to put one on the angular plane or on the roof. Um, but you know, they're, they're totally reasonable to do. They're not crazy expensive. And same with, I mean, accordion doors are really nice, but ganging just typical sliding patio doors or other more cost-effective solutions like that are also totally possible. Uh, Stuart, uh, if the branches of a tree are currently damaging the garage, any likelihood of the city permitting the tree's removal, then at a later date building a suite? So, so many variables. Uh, the location, the size, the species, the age, the condition, all of these things need to be assessed by an arborist and included in an arborist report. Um, now, the other factors are like the three Ds. If it's damaged, diseased, or dangerous, you can actually make that argument for, uh, for that tree to be removed, even if you're not proposing a construct any construction. I mean, honestly, it's very situational. Uh, it's another one of those things where hire a good arborist, hire a good architect, and you're going to increase your you're going to increase your potential of getting an approval tenfold. Exactly. Uh, next question is: What does it take to get started with a preliminary design with you guys? So in our case, uh, step one is sending us your address, info at landscape.ca. Uh, we'll make sure that your property complies. Uh, from there, we write a proposal that. Uh, outlines our scope of work and fees. Really any architect will do that for you so that you can kind of cost compare and scope compare between different consultants. And once you sign on the dotted line, you should have your survey ready to go. We can help you uh, coordinate a survey if you need that or get, go get one yourself. And then it's off to the races. With the survey in hand, we can figure out all your zoning requirements and then start to show you different design options for your site. Great presentation. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, how long does the city take to grant a building permit? How long is the permit valid for? Um, from point of us applying for the permit to a point in which we get that permit is usually between four and six weeks. I mean, it can extend up to eight to 10 weeks, um, but I mean, most are received within six. And just to reiterate, the entire design and approvals process is between four and five months um, from point of engagement to point of permit in hand. When will the final rules be set out for the regulations? So the final rules are in place for both laneway and garden suites. Um, the, one of the beauties of these policies, though, is that the planning department is really keeping close tabs on them um, and the projects that use them. And they're evolving them fairly rapidly. Like probably every two years, we're going to see minor revisions to these bylaws that frankly on our end are quite welcome. Like we wanna see like the six meter and the 6.3 meter stuff get coordinated and all the other regulations get uh, clarified and more efficient. So they are in place. We're proceeding with garden suite and laneway suite applications now, and uh, they might change in the future, but um, that's always gonna be the case. And, uh... Is it possible to predict the cost of service connections? Is there a range I should expect? That is the one thing in the entire project that is the most unpredictable and variable on the, on a project by project basis. Access, condition of your basement, I mean, timing, um, like the size of your incoming service connections that are there now all impact that. I mean, we've seen budget uh, amounts from 10 to $40,000. Um, I mean, and that, that's a discoverable condition. And it's part of the reason why we always recommend uh, carrying some sort of contingency as part of your budget. Uh, Nancy asks, once you have the building permit, is there a time frame that's valid before you have to renew it again if you haven't finished building? So uh, if you haven't finished building, it's going to remain open in perpetuity. If you haven't started building, they ask you to close it and reopen it later, usually after a few months. Um, regardless of all that, um, inertia is your enemy when it comes to design and construction. So you want to hire an architect, 
half like a few months before you're ready to start building and you want to start building so that you can finish building as efficiently as possible um, if you're thinking about getting a permit now and sitting on it to start building just don't do it just wait and get it before you want to start uh, I'm going to answer uh, Randall's too, Tony. Please, Did ahead, I read yeah. correctly somewhere that the setback and angular plane requirements are different for beaches in East York. So yes, that is correct. For garden suites only, uh, beaches East York actually has a reduced separation requirement between the main house and the garden suite. So if you live in beaches East York, like I do, you should go thank Councillor Brad Bradford because he gave you a total freebie on that one. But no one else has. Uh, I'm interested in building a fully accessible laneway house. Have you designed one of those? And what would and would those features add a lot of cost? Um, I mean, we have in very to varying degrees. Uh, we build a lot for aging in place and um, and in laws to uh, begin and basically planning twenty and thirty years out. I mean, uh, if we're talking lifts and uh, and things like that, um, that can add some cost. Um, I mean, there's many different versions of lifts that can be incorporated in many ways. Um, I mean, the big thing, though, is being smart with how we design uh, bathrooms, bedrooms, uh, being sort of conscious of like small things like uh, mobility devices, uh, clearances, uh, curbless showers, things like that. Um, so, I mean, it's not really a matter of a cost premium. It's more of a space premium. Um, so we want to just be smart with that. And uh, of course, uh, look at it critically from all sides. Next question is a good one. Is it worth it to put in some sweat equity to save money? Uh, so I have built a house myself. I half built a house, half used a GC, and I've used a GC. So I've run the gamut on this. Uh, in my opinion, sweat equity is not worth it. Hiring someone who can plan and execute a project efficiently and then getting your tenant in to start revenue um, is going to make put you way farther ahead than saving a couple thousand bucks on labor. Um, however, everyone is different. If you're a very skilled builder, there's no question that taking on scopes of work for yourself uh, can give you an advantage. Um, just be very realistic about it. I generally discourage it. Um, Still so almost 70 people left too. Thank you everyone for hanging in here. Uh, just to reiterate, if anybody's interested in a uh, free property report, whether it's for a laneway or a garden suite, send us an email at info, info at landscape.ca. Um, we will be holding another session uh, mid-March. And uh, let us know if you guys have any other questions uh, via email. And uh, hope to speak with you soon. And have a good night. <laughs> good work, Tony. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Likewise.